Tell Me What To Read is a Booktopia podcast and it is recorded on unceded Mongol country. We pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Hello, I'm Ben Hunter, Booktopia's Fiction Category Manager, and I'm really excited today because I'm joined by Catherine Collette and Kate Milton Hall. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, this is incredible. We're going to do a uh, simulcast podcast, which I can't say 10 times fast, <laughs> <laughs> um, between Booktopia's podcast, uh, Tell Me What to Read, and Catherine and Kate's your podcast is the first time. It's excellent. Go and subscribe to it if you haven't already. And we are going to talk about our favourite best debut releases of 2022, which is so frightening to even think that we have to come up with a list. I can't believe it. Um, but if you are looking for a perfect debut book, this is the place to be. So if you're listening to this on the First Time Podcast, head over and check out Booktopia's Tell Me What to Read podcast, where they talk with the hottest celebrities and your favourite authors. For those for those of us on uh, Tell Me What to Read, come and listen to Kate and my podcast, The First Time, which is a bit of a behind the scenes into the world of writing and publication. We talk mostly with Australian writers about how they got agents, working with editors, how they use social media, how they've survived scathing and also good reviews of their work. Um, but now, without further ado, let's dive into the debuts we've been reading and enjoying. Has it been a good uh, year to date for you guys for debuts, in your humble opinions? I think it's been huge. I think there's mm. been so many books to read. <laughs> I think I completely agree, been massive and I just think there's something so special about a debut book. Yes. Also really exciting to see that debut um, writers are again kind of allowed out in the world, um, other than mm. those poor debuts who had to do their release their books during lockdown and COVID, um, that at least now they can kind of get out in the world and meet those readers and booksellers, which is really fun and exciting for them and us. Yes, and I've been discovering a few good ones already. I'm sure you guys have too. Uh, should we should we just go in rounds? <laughs> and, Let's do and, it. And yeah, talk amazing. It. I'm, I'm going to kick off with something I read earlier in the year, which uh, completely just shook me to the core. Uh, it is a book called Son of Sin by Omar Sakir. Mm. Uh, it's published by a firm press. I see you guys nodding. Mm -hmm. uh, he is an uh, Arab Australian guy who. who Sydney and he's a poet he's such mm. a good poet and he's written a debut novel which is uh very very close to lived experience it is a coming of age but it's also kind of an epic poem of uh the two Sydneys and being both in this liminal space between being foreign and being uh Australian uh and being neither and uh having uh, a family that is broken um, and a faith that uh, rejects that and having a, a sexuality that is rejected by faith as well um, and just the incredible class and race divisions that uh, just ricochet through every part of lived experience, uh, particularly for young people and particularly for queer young people. There's so many layers to it and you spend a lot of time in cemeteries in this book. It is, it is dark and brilliant and I just love it. Excellent. It's actually sitting here on my table. It's one of the ones that <laughs> is um, on my on my staggering TBR pile, but I know it's been recommended by so many people. I'm going to jump in before Kate does because I suspect she's going to, um, well, gonna maybe she's going to. each other's. I'm going to steal it before you do. <laughs> this book, uh, Only a Monster by Vanessa mm. Len, is uh, stand out. So it's fantasy set in a paranormal world in which monsters exist. Having said that, I would recommend it to all kinds of readers. It's got a really interesting premise that monsters live in the world and they take years from the lives of non-monsters. And if they take too many years off that person's life, then the human will die. It is fast paced. It is so, so clever. Uh, Vanessa Lynn reading her work as a writer is the sort of thing that is both uh, beautiful and wonderful and torturous because it makes you absolutely green eyed with jealousy. Um, the, the logic within the book is super smart. 
but the end is where the logic is just used to its full effect and it absolutely blows you away. It is a wonderful book. It's so good. It's so good. And her stuff that she does with time travel too, it's just so smart and the way she plays with the tropes and so good. We actually chatted to her at uh, Bendigo Writers Festival, which and we'll have that up on our podcast at some stage before the end of this season. I'm going to go on with something else that does incredible world building, and that is um, Else Fitzgerald's debut collection, Everything Feels oh, Like the End of the World, um, which is only recently out. It's so good. So Else Fitzgerald won the Rochelle Prize um, a couple of years back for this collection of short stories. It's climate fiction. It's spec fic. Um, it's a, a collection of stories that begins in the kind of present um, and then goes far, far into the future. But she describes it as, uh, it's not a kind of chronological world. She describes it as like a, if you blow a dandelion and um, all the parallel worlds kind of, kind of go off. Um, it is terrifying in parts, really scary, the kind of um, speculative worlds, possible scenarios she's written about climate change and very um, Victorian based. So she originally hails from kind of Far East Gippsland and Lakes Entrance. So there's uh, some stories set there, but then also this ever changing kind of Melbourne that gets um, slowly drowned. I think uh, every story is incredible, but there's also this um, sense that it's the relationships and kind of love and grief and loss and and who we call kin and who we might rely on in different times, which is the real kind of beating heart of that one. So I hugely recommend those stories. Um, getting a lot of love on the socials too at the moment. I'm going to riff off of love and grief and loss with yes. Sunbathing by Isabel Beach. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I, can, I can see you just like inhale and go, oh, he's taking it. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's it's just gorgeous. It's so good. It's published by Alan and Unwin. It is, uh, I think she has a history, Isabel, with uh, Kill Your Darlings. Um, and this debut novel is, it takes the reader into the mountains of Italy uh, where uh, the main character has, um, has traveled after being stuck in a place of deep, grief and loss in her own life uh, from a number of weeks. This has been a, in a place of stasis. And uh, she has friends who are getting married and they've, they've got an old villa in the mountains and they invite her. She goes there. She stays uh, in, a, in a birthing room, a room where women for generations had their babies, had their children um, before uh, epidurals and all the things that make having children uh, slightly bearable in uh, the modern era, and there's there's a sense of um, there's a sense of gravity to that, but there's also just this incredible place where uh, conversations have had, cherries are picked and discussed, and food is prepared, and dishes are washed, and life just uh, moves at a at a slow and gorgeous pace and uh your your main character she finds a, a sense of healing and uh for me as a reader this was just so indulgent and wonderful and it was healing for me too it was it was just such a good journey and such a beautiful reading experience i cannot recommend that enough that's another one that's getting a lot of love on mm. socials as well. Um, I do think that grief is the emotion of the moment. <laughs> like I think it it started with Fleabag and I think the past couple of years grief has has really been present. I kind of think it has something to do with climate change and that particular emotion being in the ether. Um, but my next example is also grief-based. It's Natasha Scholl's Found Wanting, mm. which is... I guess, uh, literary autofiction or memoir, It um, the story or the, the kind of the premise is that Natasha's partner, Rob, died. I think she was 24 at the time. He was 27. And so it explores the aftermath of that. It's a heavy topic. Um, it is about grief. But I think what's really interesting about her as a writer is she clearly has a sense of humour. And so amid sort of the darkness there is light and there is funny moments and it is hopeful and so 
while it's a story about grief, it's very much about life as well. Um, and I think she's a writer that has a real Sarah Krasenstein vibe to her. Mm. I don't really know how, but she definitely does. And I'm so excited to see what she writes next. Mm. Mm -mm. Um, someone who I am very excited to see what they do next is Rhett Davis and his mm -hmm. debut Hovering, which I think won the 2020 VPLA. Um, so this was out quite early this year with Hachette. Uh, it is the story really of a town or a city that begins to move in the night. Uh, so people wake up in the morning and streets have changed directions or shopping malls are in different places or potentially even their house is on a different street. So it's this kind of uh, dystopic world. Uh, it's a lot about what it means to be in the online world. Um, it's also about art and about activism. And Rhett Davis is just such a kind of electrifying writer. The, the form of the novel itself is really experimental. So there's sections of it that are in tables, um, kind of very much the vibe of Jennifer Egan's new The Candy House in terms mm, of the cool. layout and, and the kind of way that he has really pushed, I suppose, what the vessel of the novel is. He's pushed it to the extremes. But I really loved hovering like it did things to my brain good things to my brain um and yeah really excited to see what what Rhett Davis does next as well I'm gonna have a quick shout out to one that I just read in the space of a day um <laughs> and it's it's not the perfect novel but it it really it did the job and it's uh it's quite simple and clever it is um it is called Ruth and Penn and it's from an Irish author Emil Pine uh, and it's set in Dublin over the space of a day uh, in, I think, 2018. Uh, and there's two perspectives. One is a, uh, a young woman who has autism, who is going to a uh, Extinction Rebellion or, a, or a, um, a climate protest rally, right? And another woman uh, is much older and she uh, is going about her day in what could be the 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 very breaking point of her marriage um with uh, a really difficult time with her partner and both these characters have nothing to do with each other but they cross paths and you just flip between perspectives uh close third person perspectives uh and you explore uh just everything that is going right and wrong in their world uh and as you as you move through it uh it's it's just really simply done and it um you you don't you don't get a, 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 a even like a proper solution you just get that day and it's it's just a, it's a it's a great example of of of, of the novel as portraiture uh, mm. and i just i just thought that was really remarkably done I'm going to mention Carly Maslin's Show Me Where It Hurts. This is a book that is super clever. It um, Basically, it, it is a collection of essays. It mixes pop culture criticism with personal essays about her lived experience of life with chronic invisible illness. So she has essays on things like memes, dating, Beyonce, Frida Kahlo, uh, an example would be she looks at the crisis in housing for people with disabilities through the lens of or with reference to the Golden Girls TV show, um, which you walk away thinking, God, that was an incredible TV show, like very groundbreaking for its time. What is really uh, smart about it, I think, is that she has this wonderfully clever play between invisible illness, which is obviously something that you can't see, and these very visible things that are pop culture references. And it is such an effective way of communicating what life is like, can be like, um, for her particular sort of type of chronic illness. Um, I interviewed Kylie earlier this week with an episode coming out uh, with her. She said she wrote it for people, for other people like herself who experienced chronic illness. But I felt like it was a book that was written for me who has no experience of that. So I think it's one that um, is very accessible and easy to read, but also shifts the way that you look at stuff. I will never look at memes the same way mm -hmm. having read this book. So highly, highly recommend. Oh, my gosh. My list just keeps getting higher and higher. I know. I know. I'm going to be super sneaky 
And I'm going to get in a couple on a theme because I reckon that the debut crimes that have come out this year are mm. hot, so hot. And I haven't read all of them. Um, we interviewed uh, Josh Kemp, whose novel uh, Banjuan won the UWAP unpublished manuscript, but has just gone on to win the Ned Kelly Best Debut Crime Fiction. Um, kind of massive, true Australian Gothic, uh, terrifying kind of read. Um, I know that Danuka McKenzie's The Torrents came out this year as well, but two that I read back to back and Ben, you said books that you read in a day. Well, these absolutely are books that you read mm -hmm. in a day were um, James McKenzie Watson's Denizen and Hayley Scrivener's Dirt Town. Like, and together, together they are such a great combo and I know they've been doing some um, kind of events and things together. Just that exploration of rural Australia in James's um, novel, it's very much about the mental health crisis and how it's dealt with in in rural Australia. But just this beautifully put together it does not read like a debut book at all, and I don't think any of these ones do. Um, and Haley Scrivener's Dirt Town, which is getting heaps of love from everywhere, yeah. again, just magnificent. Um, so crime is going great guns. It's such a crowded uh, genre now, the Australian noir, but new writers just keep coming at it and they keep bringing new stuff to it. Uh, Wake by Shelley Burr is mm. phenomenal as well. It's really special. It, it takes readers to the aftermath of a disappearance in a small town and the people mm. who are left behind years later and the sleuths and the creeps on the internet want to try and solve it. It's, um, that's, it's, it, the, people just keep bringing a new lens to this uh, really effective and, and just beloved subgenre, if you will. It's really exciting. What more can we squeeze in? Uh, I, uh, just on the mystery theme, uh, this is a mystery, but it's not a mystery. And it's also, uh, it's it's just a gorgeous uh, love letter to uh, um, Cabramatta. Uh, All that's left unsaid, Tracy Lean. It's also like being published internationally and it's a huge deal. Um, and uh, she's in vogue, she's everywhere. So oh I, I'm God. very excited. That is just come out uh, and I'm, I'm 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 it's one of my ones to keep my eyes on for the rest of the year for being a bestseller i was going to mention too that uh when this year on the first time podcast we have interviewed what we regarded as our kind of masters of uh, australian literature and international literature our wish list really catherine and i and one of the books that came up multiple times as a recommendation because we ask all of our guests to recommend a debut book um was mandy beaumont's the furies which both mm. really early in the year mm. like tony birch bernadette brennan all kind of recommended as um a book to really look out for. And I know that it's um, got a lot of love on, on short lists as well. So that's another one that I would add to the list. I'm going to mention The Natural History of Love by Carolyn Petit, because I think it's one that's really, really slipped under the radar. And I'm really surprised it hasn't got the buzz that, um, say, the Dictionary of Lost Words has gotten, because I'd put them in many ways in the same bucket. People who liked uh, Elizabeth Gilbert's The Signature of All Things will love this book. It's set against a backdrop of that kind of Charles Darwin, naturalist, uh, plants and animals butting up against religion moment in time. Uh, and it's you have a, an older French naturalist who meets a young Brazilian woman. The French naturalist is married. The two of them end up moving uh, to Melbourne via France together to live. And this part of it is, is a true story. Uh, they live in adjacent houses that are secretly joined. So they maintain this veneer of civility, but um, behind the scenes, things are quite different. It is it is a cracker of a book. I would, I, it's a sort of book that you could gift to people, um, has a really wide readership. I'm really surprised we haven't heard more about it. Mm. It is hard, isn't it, with the with the debuts because it's it is a really <laughs> seems like a really crowded market and there's only just enough space. And even as we're all describing, there's so many books that came out this year that I haven't even got to read yet. Um, that I really really want to read as well. Um, so there's certainly in short story two collections that mm. I'm desperate to, and I've got I've got one of them here. Um, one of them is uh, Siang Lu's The Whitewash. Um, which is oh, UQP. Yeah. It's just out. So I haven't had a chance to to read this yet, um, but uh, it's satire. It's looking, it, he seems to be a pretty funny guy. And I have just this morning, he's released as well a website 
Um, it's called the Beige Index, and it's a um, like a Bechdel test for race. Uh, so it's exploring oh, ethnic wow. representation in the IMDb top 200 films over time. And they've come up with um, these algorithms to work out how many um, people, non-white people, are represented in and in the credits, like actually credited as actors or on somehow um, on the production set. And it's extraordinary. I've already got lost in it this morning. Uh, it's funny and smart and also just kind of terrifying as well as you can imagine. So that is one. Um, Siang Lu's The Whitewash is one. And also... The other one is Every Version of You, Grace Chan's short stories as well, which, you know, one of the things that I look out for is people saying um, this is a really new voice or this is exciting or this is something I haven't seen before. And lots of people have been describing Grace Chan's um, collection of short stories as in exactly that vein. So um, dystopia, um just sounds really exciting and really interesting and i'm looking forward to reading that too i think we could we could go on all day we could. <laughs> but we, we we totally should wrap up thank you so much for uh letting me join you today this this has been really special for me and i um it's given me uh, a kick up the bum to to go read more of these because there's this there's, there's so many good books to discover uh what are you guys going to be reading next one of the other ones that I am looking forward to is um, this, Lister Rose, uh, this is YA, um, The Upwelling, which uh, Lister Rose is a First Nations writer. This is her debut. She won the Black and Right uh, Fellowship, which I know is another place that I look to um, for what I want to read next. And um, this is fantasy. Uh, she, Lister Rose is also like a massive surfer and I think she's the first editor-in-chief of Surfing Life magazine, um, first uh, female, sorry, editor-in-chief of Surfing Life magazine. Um, so I'm super excited about that. I sometimes share the new books that come in with my um, eldest daughter and so we mm -hmm. have both got this on, on our list to read as well. I love that. My next to be read is Gemini Falls by Sean Wilson, which is getting a lot of buzz. Um, it's uh, set in the Depression era. It's crime-based. I don't know a lot about it, but um, I keep hearing people mention it. So that's my... I've just my read it. Uh, thank you oh. so much. Oh, is it good? It's, it's, it is really good. It's, um, it's got a little bit of a Jasper Jones vibe, but it's also oh, right. it's, it's, it's set against Depression era um, uh, Australia, particularly like country towns. It's got a really interesting look into that um kind of cultural change that's happening in in society but also it's just a gorgeous story of, of, of kids <laughs> in a town trying to um solve a mystery that's kind of swept the place and uh the the child's perspective has just a few um salt flakes of uh trent dalton's boy swallows universe mm -hmm. um and the father character is gorgeous he reminds me a little bit of atticus finch so um, yeah, it's that, that is, that is a, that's a great one to end on. <laughs> ben, that is such a good descri de, um, description. Can I say that I'm going to steal the description, a few salt flakes of mm. dot, dot, dot. That's really good. I like that. I'm going to. I think I'm getting, I think I was just hungry when I said that. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. I'm, I'm stealing it. Thank you. <laughs> it's been a, a, a total joy chatting books today. Um, and uh, you can uh, subscribe to. Uh, Booktopia's podcast coming up to read right now description below never stop reading uh the first time podcast you can subscribe to us you can find all of the books that we've mentioned is this right ben you'll have them up we'll have them up um every single one of those ones that we urge people to go and read for our listeners at the first time podcast you can check out the booktopia tell me what to read uh podcast and um Join them over there as well because there's so many good books to hear. And Catherine and I obviously can't mention all of them all of the time. Thank you so much for listening to us and keep those book recommendations coming to us. 